Welcome to the Trevor Roberts Talk Fest. Today we have Shane Lee, founder of TAAPS, Texas Acknowledgement, Awareness, and Preservation of Sasquatch. Shane is working on uncovering the truth about Bigfoot, specifically evidence that Sasquatch resides in Texas. Shane, thank you for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me. How are you? Um, doing excellent. I am very excited to have you join. This has been, we've been talking about this for three or four weeks, and the whole time I've been uh, telling my Excuse wife, me. telling uh, my uh, sister-in-law, and and beyond. Like A lot of people are super into this topic, and there's a lot of places we can go, so I am thrilled to have you join. I was looking at some of the work you've done, and it looks like you've done a ton of work on this, so i um, very thrilled to have you. Thank you so much for spending your time here. Uh, would you like to do a little background on maybe just yourself, how you got into it, and uh, maybe a little bit on TAAPS? Uh, sure. Uh, well, I think um, pretty typical, you know, having that childhood, hearing those first Big Fit documentaries or movies that would come out, um, some of them a little cheesy, some of them not, but especially hearing, you know, like unexplained mysteries and stuff like that. And as a child, your mind wanders. And, uh, but as I grew up, you know, it was always in the back of my head. So whenever I'd see something about Bigfoot on TV, I'd have to watch it because it was just mind blowing to me. And uh, I kind of grew up with um, kind of being raised to always have an open mind. You know, don't shut people down, just uh, fact check yourself, do your own research, and get out there and discover things. Um, if you have a closed off mind, you're not going to discover anything new in this world. Okay, you're dead in the water. Um, but to, right. to get out there and do your own investigations and research is the way that you're going to find out things. So um, as I as I grew up and got older until recently, you know, last uh, seven or eight years, and I was listening to some other um, podcasts about Sasquatch, like Sasquatch Chronicles, for example. It's a good one. And I heard some of their episodes that had to do with Texas. Okay. Now. That absolutely blew me away because I'm still in the, the mindset that these things are, of course, there's more than one, uh, but they're up in Washington. They're in the Pac Northwest, you know, and uh, then I'm starting to discover, you no, know, they're, they're, they're kind of everywhere and they're in my state, Texas. Now, the crazy thing is I, I was raised in Texas, mainly West Texas. Okay. I did, if, if you go East Texas, Central on over to East Towards the Texas Louisiana border, it's all forest and heavy forest. Some of it's very thick and dense, full, huge pines. It's just beautiful forest. And once I learned that, I was like, well, you know what? The next step was for me to go find out what is actually going on here. And uh, so I actually uh, got on Google Earth. And okay. I decided on the Big Ticket National Preserve. And I got on there and I picked a spot that looked like nobody would go there. There's no trails going by an area. They got a good water supply that's year round because that's supposed to be a good food source area and uh, like a highway. And I thought, okay. And I just kind of put my finger on a spot right there. And I said, that's where I'm going to go. It was way down the pipeline. Wow. And we'll get, we'll get to that encounter later. But let's just say I struck gold my first time out. And from then on, I was hooked. Oh, yeah. Here we are now. And uh, I guess about four years ago, I decided to, to uh, open the group TAPS, um, which okay. is T double A P S. And like you've already said, Texas Knowledge and Awareness and Preservation of Sasquatch. And the main reason I did it was because I found it so difficult that if I wanted to get out there with somebody and investigate property with them or an area with them, you know, you really had to be in a circle. Or you just weren't going to get invited. So I thought if I did that and I go out, then other people want to go out, especially skeptics. Skeptics want to come out. Let's really? Go. Yeah. And the best part about it is you're not just going out there to try to find evidence of Bigfoot. Some of the best people I've met are in doing two things, fishing and Bigfoot hunting. Yeah, I, don't have to say I hate to say the word hunting because we're not hunting a Bigfoot. I am a no kill group, so okay, unless your life absolutely depends on it. Uh, but meeting some of the best people I've ever met that have been out there researching Bigfoot, 
And so even if you come out as a skeptic or a full non-believer and we have a couple of nights of just no action, if you leave a non-believer still, that's fine. But I bet you met some great people and had a blast regardless. So, And uh, it'll make you want to go out again. And then that next time may be the time that everything happens and makes your mind start to go, okay, well, something's going on, you know. And uh, so that's really what happened. Wow, that had to have been terrifying that first trip, uh, because I've I've started to observe some of these deep wildernessy areas just driving by, and I'm like, I don't know if I could ever go out there. <laughs> and it sounds like you picked yeah. a super remote spot and just said, I'm going out here. Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't. I don't. There's, there's not a lot of things in life that scare me, uh, mainly because of, of my past life and the, the jobs and careers I've had. Um, but to go out there, I went out there with a friend the first time, and he was just as much into it as I was, as excited as I was. But, and uh, we, we had, uh, I don't even know how to explain it, but we decided to go out and explore in the woods. And I'd heard a lot of encounters. Um, I don't know if you want to get into these stories yet or if you want to ask other questions first, because once no. I get into these, there's there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, why don't you um, maybe start off with like that first story of your first encounter? Like you've already got me hooked on that. And also, I think it'll help me understand like, OK, this is if that happened, why you would want to continue and really explore mm-hmm. this. So, yeah, go go for it. Okay. Let's just get right into uh, the good stuff. You know, that's what people want. Uh, yeah, let's let's get in. People don't have to wait. They get to hear it right now. <laughs> right, yeah. So we, we drive down this pipe now. People out there listening, driving down pipelines is illegal, so don't do it. Um, however, if you get permission from a ranger that says that you have access down that pipeline, then you're okay. Uh, so I just want to put that out there so nobody drives out a pipeline and gets a $5,000, $10,000 ticket and wants to blame this guy, you know? Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't so, know that. Um, so. Yeah, well, I checked with the ranger, told her we're scouting out some hunting areas. Um I don't hunt, never been into it really. Um, I guess you could call me a hypocrite because I, I, I can't pull the trigger on something that just looks so cute and friendly, but I'll eat it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. kill it, I'll eat it. So, I'm the same way. You know, I don't, sure you, yeah. I'm not like, um, you know, I have no problem with other people hunting, but I'm not really mm-hmm. interested in pulling the trigger right. on an animal myself. Right. Yeah, thank God fish aren't really cute because then I might have a problem with that too. Yeah, <laughs> I exactly. So, I do uh, like fishing. Okay. All right. But anyways, we get out there and it's probably about, um, it's not quite, not quite, it's like that dusk period, you know, where it's about to get dark, but not quite there. And we go all the way down this pipeline and this pipeline goes all the way down like this. And then it fingers off into a little thin pipeline to the right, a little one in the middle and a little one to the left. So imagine like a fork that's bent, just three prongs, and okay. there's a creek. So they have to drop down the creek, and then they'll come back up on their side and take off. But, so we pull up. We're uh, probably about uh, 20, only 25 yards from this creek, which just drops into the water. And we've got this nice little thicket, and I'm like, this is the spot. And I said, I'm going to go look at this creek. And he says, I'm going to go uh, take a leak. So <laughs> he walks over into that thicket, and... Uh, Next thing I know, he's, he's Shane, Shane, Shane. He's come on running. I'm like, what? And what? He says, I go over there to take a leak. He said, something jumped down the tree. He said, I don't mean like an animal. I mean, it was something heavy. He goes, boom. And he goes, doof, doof, through the bush. And he was just, he was white as a ghost, freaked out. And I said, well, I said, I mean, it could have been a bear. You know, they're pretty rare to see him out here. Pretty sure. damn rare. Yeah. And uh, they're usually, usually not bipedal. And that heavy when they run, but I said, but I think we may have picked a good spot. Let's pitch tent here. He's like, okay, so we do. And I'll make this one kind of a long story short. Um, oh, let me back up. When that first one hit and ran off, he had heard a growl in the tree. Also, right after that, like a low guttery, like okay, and that freaked him out as well. So keep that in mind. Later on that night, you know, we eat. It's just probably pushing 11, 11 o'clock, almost 12 midnight, if I remember correctly. And we decided we're just going to go for a little walk, a little hike. It's, it's eerie quiet out there. And uh, this is a, a 
around the beginning of, or no, excuse me, if I remember right, the end of November. And uh, so we go walk into the woods for a while. And, and I had heard these encounters about people that would, what they think would, would happen is they would interrupt a hunt between Sasquatch and a deer or Sasquatch and a boar or wild hog. And how, how they would get a little aggravated, might topple a tree or make some grunts or something. And okay. uh, so all these things I've heard, you know, I learned as much as I could before I went out, obviously. I just think that's a smart thing to do. But, yeah. And uh, so so we're, we're not finding much of anything. It's, it's so dark. But we're coming back. We come back into this. We're camped on the right part of the pipeline, that little finger there. So you got the middle one, woods woods this one woods forever so we're coming out of the woods forever and we walk up the pipeline a little bit because we're going to go around to get to our camp and this little thing comes running out of the out of the tree line there and uh, it freezes it's looking at us um, i've got very minimal light and i'm like i think that's a deer because the eyes are white and the deer typically have white eyes and uh, he's freaking out. He's like, cougar, cougar, it's a cougar, shoot it. You know, and I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no. I, I said, hold on. I walk up closer, and this it's a little a little deer, you know. And the little deer is, like, nervous, just very nervous. And uh, just looking, looking, looking. He, and he sees that we're people, I guess, because he decided to walk, I'd say, within 10 feet from us, which is very unusual behavior for any wild animal, period, let alone a deer. And we're both like, what is going on here? And then all of a sudden you hear a little scruffle over here in the bushes from where he came out. And he takes off. He runs lateral, uh, kind of away from us, behind us at an angle back into the woods. And then you hear over here on the left side of the pipeline, which keep in mind, this is all, they call it the big ticket for a reason. You know, it's dense. Yeah, okay. And you just hear this tree just, just the, I've got pictures of it and the circumference of it is about like that big. It's a pretty tall pine. It just gets cracked over at about the six foot mark. It just broke over and it was the loudest thing I've ever heard in the woods. It just sounded like a sounded like a, a plane just crashed into the woods right beside us. And that oh was very nerve wracking. And uh, I told my buddy, I don't want to put any names here. I yeah. told my buddy, I said, uh, Look, I said, I think I know what just happened, but let's just move along, get back to our camp, and uh, I'll tell you what I think just happened, and then tomorrow at daylight, we'll investigate that. And so we go back over to the camp, and I said, I think we just interrupted a hunt. And I told him about the things I'd heard in the past and all that. I said, but tomorrow we will go investigate that. We'll be able to find that tree real easy, <laughs> you know, and we'll make sure it wasn't rotted or anything. And... Uh, but um, during that, we're sitting there and we're having a snack. It's probably two o'clock in the morning right now. And then you hear this all of a sudden out of a tree. Boom. Just like what he had described earlier. Yep. It just sounded like, like a big rock hit the ground. And all the brush breaking and stuff. And we were both sitting there with our mouths probably hitting the, hitting the ground. And I was like, so one jumped out of the tree earlier. The growl you heard was the one still in the tree. And we interrupted a hunt. He's pissed. And I'm like, look, this is all just theory right now. You know, yeah. We can't tell anything until we go investigate in the daytime. So, so we finally go to sleep. It's probably about 4 o'clock in the morning. And uh, <laughs> sleep pretty good that night. You know, I slept great. I sleep great in the woods. I don't care what's going on around me. And wow, uh, they not... can be vocalizing around me. I'm going to sleep great. Uh, that would be terrifying. We get a... Oh, gosh, no. It's... Once I'm out, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we woke up probably by 11. And I, before we ate, did anything, I said, come on, let's go look. So I was pretty excited. We go over there. We go around to that pipeline and go in where we heard it. Found the tree immediately. You can't miss a six-foot snapped off tree. And, uh, you know, like it's right on the trunk, on the ground. uh, no, this, the, the trunk's down here, right? 
Okay. Go as tall as I am. I got a picture of me standing by it right here. And the tree is broke. It's six foot, uh, a little over six foot, broke over. Snap. So we go, we find it. And it's not rotted or anything. It's just something just snapped to that tree. And, uh, but before we even looked to see if the tree was, I was looking all around the base and there was two beautiful impressions right in front of this tree. Uh, or I'm using front as a correlation to the right, but two nice big impressions. And I'm just, we're just like, oh my God, we're so excited. We start snapping pictures of us and everything. And then uh, this is amateur hour. Remember, this is my first time out, so you can't hold it against me. But we go to take oh. pictures of the impressions at the base, and they're they're they're, they're destroyed. Yeah, we stopped all over it because <laughs> oh. we were so excited <laughs> taking pictures of everything. Uh, it was gone. But, so that was the, the first thing that happened, and uh, it, it led up to a sequence of events. Because when we got home. Uh, this person I was out with is related to my ex-wife, so we were telling my ex-wife when I was married to her about what was going on out there, and she, she believed us. But I still, I could see that little lingering thought in her head, like yeah, they're basically crazy, nut, you know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, so I talked to her. I said, "Look, why don't I take you out there? This is a great place. I want you to experience this. I want you to see what's going on." And it wasn't uh, two weeks, I want to say, not even two weeks later. Um, we left on a Friday. But me and this other person came out of the woods, I think, on a Monday or a Tuesday. So, yeah, it would have been almost two weeks later on a weekend. I took her out to the same place. The plan is to get there during daylight hours. Didn't happen. Never does. Nothing ever goes according to plan. Uh, we get actually, yeah, actually get out there right at 11, and that takes us to the exact same spot. And I'm, cause I'm thinking, well, if they were here then, why wouldn't they still be in the area? And, you know, these things do like to move a little bit, but they have their area. And when we get there and take everything out of the car, if we go to set the tent up, it's the first thing we're setting up. And we didn't even get halfway through setting this, this chair up. And, but mind you, it's a, there's no full moon going on. Either. Okay, moon's gone. We're in, we're in total darkness. We just have our headlamps on. Um, we're about 75% putting the tent up, and then you just hear. The, and I knew this right away because I had heard it on uh, the Sierra sounds. If nobody's heard the Sierra sounds, I highly recommend going and listening to that. You can just Google the Sierra sounds Sasquatch. Um, Ron Moorhead recorded those, and a uh, uh, Navy linguist has actually come up with the, that they are an actual language. They recorded the Sasquatch are speaking an actual language. But their whoops, whoops on there were dead ringer to what went on. Uh, as I said, I was almost setting the tent up, and I just saw a sudden, whoop, 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 whoop. They're just going off. There's probably out three, maybe four. One of them sounded really young. Uh, they all sounded kind of young, but one of them sounded really young. And she just stopped. She was like, what the hell is going on? You know, and I said, I told you, she was, how do you know a Sasquatch? You know, and I'm like, well, first, nothing else makes that noise. And uh, I played the Sierra sounds for her. And so the, she was like, oh, my God. And you could, so then you could start to hear a little soft breaking out there walking. Not walking much, but walking. It's kind of pacing. You know, and so you can hear all this. It's going on. It's it's like dead silent. You could hear a pin drop out there. Uh, no crickets, frogs, nothing's going on. And this just keeps going on and going on. And we're listening for a while. And I tell her, I said, all right, let's finish this tent. We finished the tent. And, oh, my gosh, we, we had uh, wasted so much time just listening. It was probably 1 o'clock in the morning by then. We forgot to bring our chairs, so we were sitting on a cot. But the cots in the tent were both dead tired. And I said, let's just lay here and listen. Here's the weird thing about it. Now, back then, I didn't have any recording devices. No recorders, no thermals, nothing like that. Just a phone. And we were in so amazement, so much awe at what was going on around us. We both had phones. Neither one of us. Pick it up, started recording anything. 
any of them. It's the weirdest thing. And I've heard this before about people who are like, why didn't you record? And I'm like, I didn't even think of it. You know? And so now I get it. I'll never make that mistake again. But I was so in awe and excitement that it, just, it didn't even cross my mind. I'm laying there. She's laying there. My dog's laying in the middle. We're just listening. And you can just hear him. You know, the little one. Well, you probably don't realize how, you know, into it you're going to get at this point, you know? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we were into it. And not scared because this none of this sounded aggressive whatsoever. This all sounded like like they were happy that somebody turned the TV on. They had some entertainment, you know, it was weird. But now that first night, that just went on like that all night. You could hear him get closer. And then you could hear him back away. And I distinctly remember like a littler one. He just made, a, his sounds were lighter, but he, he did more of a run, you know. And uh, But it's a freezing outside for one thing. So anything they step on is just making noise. And they're being very quiet compared to the size of these things and et cetera. But, but their whoops are loud and crisp. And probably about four o'clock in the morning, I'm dozing finally. Because I told you, I can sleep. <laughs> uh, she keeps waking me up. They're getting louder. They're getting loud. So I hear it. I hear it. I hear it. And then she'd wake me up again. Do you hear that one? Yes, yes, sir. Look, I said, just relax. If they wanted to hurt us, and she, I didn't even finish my sentence. She said, oh, they would have done it by now. It's like, exactly. So, uh, we finally did fall asleep. It was probably close to five in the morning. And I, as a matter of fact, I think that's about what time it stopped happening. It was about five in the morning. And uh, we slept. I think we slept about 12. But, and as cool as that was, it wasn't over. So I'm in a little super room and I'm like, okay, let's go get some uh, beer. And I wanted to have a cold beer out there. And we need ice. So we, we this was me just being an idiot, but. <laughs> took our little Subaru around to the other little pipeline right there and slid into some very wet sand. It rains out there a lot. And uh, I was stuck. I was stuck. There was no getting out. I had actually had to call a tow truck to come out, drive down this pipeline to pull me out. And the uh, cool thing about it was this truck was like a 1970-something big old Dodge Mack look cool truck it was awesome but and i helped the guy <laughs> chain up his tires to get down the pipeline so i got a big discount so that really helped i didn't have to pay full price thank god uh, but he got me out and uh, so we go to the store um, i actually took her to the big thicket national preserve uh, ranger office because they have a really neat museum in there so anybody that goes to that area I definitely recommend going and checking out the main office because the museum is outstanding Okay. And uh, I also want to tell you, the listeners that aren't familiar with it, the Big Thicket National Preserve is broken down into units. Like, for example, you got the Turkey Unit, uh, the Lance Rozier Unit. Uh, the place we're at is the Big Sandy Unit. And they're not all together. They're all broke up into different parts uh, in that area of Texas. And so... We go back, and this time I'm not going to drive down the pipeline. I know of an alternate route, and I'm a guy. I want to get off road a little bit too, so I go down this really cool forested trail. It's actually a fire break, and uh, go down, and we get to this one part where it dips down a little bit. And I didn't realize how much rain had come down that little area because when I was going across it, it looked dry. I got stuck again. Um, yeah, it's probably about. We probably got about four hours before it gets dark, so we're good. I'm digging out. I'm making a lot of noise, a lot of noise, and I'm not getting anywhere. <laughs> so, yeah. So, anyways, it's I, I messed with it for a good three and a half hours at least, and finally I, I gave up. I said, like, we, we got a long walk down this pipeline to get back to our camp. We're not going to call somebody to come and get us now. It's too late. And um, so... We're like, okay, we get everything. Um, my dog, people that know me, go out with me, know my dog, my yellow lab, Blue. He's my Sasquatch dog. Been with me for years out there. But and we come out this trail onto the big pipeline that I drive down, that I mentioned before, and we take a left to go down the pipeline. 
And when we get about a quarter of the way just walking, we get Claire's Day, two of them whistling from the wood line right there. Now I'm not talking about bird whistles or anything else that whistles. I'm talking about just my mouth is so dry, I probably can't even whistle, but like just whistles, like mimicking one of us if we would whistle. Wow, that was really good. She was like, thank you. <laughs> yeah. She was like, what the hell is going on? And I, I just I immediately stopped and I thought, you know what? It just dawned on me. I said, we've made all that noise. We know they're in the area. I said, why wouldn't they have come up here and checked this out? They were probably watching me the whole time trying to get out of that. So now we're walking back down to the camp and they're going to mess with us a little bit. You know, it's, it's, it's not unheard of, you know. Um, not all Sasquatch are these aggressive people that want to kill, you know. So there are a lot of people out there to put bad raps on them. But I want to say this real fast. Sasquatch are like people. Um, everybody's got different mentalities and attitudes. Some people are serial killers, you know. Most of us are good people. It's the same thing with all the animal kingdom. You, know, you get the normal ones and you get the bad apples. It just happens. So, but that was just a side note. Okay. So, but before we start walking, I whistle back. I said, "Watch this." I don't know if something's going to happen, but I whistle a different tone, and I can't remember what it was. But I whistled something different, and they mimicked it both of them perfectly to the T. And I was telling her, I said, "Whoa, this is, this is yeah." I said, "So far, this I can't. I know we had to spend like three hundred dollars to get pulled out this morning." I'm stuck again. I said, but this is the coolest thing that's ever happened to me last night and right now. Yeah. I said, I hope they end up at camp again. And she was like, yeah, as long as they're nice, <laughs> you know. So we walk all the way down. And we got, by the time we got back to our camp, it was dark. I pulled one of the cots out of the tent. We're starving. You and did I'm, get out. You got, your, just, you got your truck no. out? No. Oh, wow. It was a little Subaru Crosstrek. Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, excellent cars. I just drove mine my ship. I didn't realize it. Never made the mistake again. But, uh, we walked all the way back and we got there about probably about 30 minutes after it just got full on dark. And uh, we're, I was dead tired. Uh, I know she was tired from not getting a whole lot of sleep the night before. So I pulled out a cot. And I mean, this is us walking up to the tent, me and Zip, it, it's dark now. I pull out a cot for us to sit down. My plan is I'm going to do a little fire, cook up some hot dogs real fast. Something easy. We're starving. We're hungry. We're tired. You know, all of that took the span of maybe 60 seconds to unzip the tent and pull the cot out and put it down and sit down before I could even grab the hot dogs. This little finger pipeline we're on, you know, it's only 20 meters from one side to the other, and it's all thick wood over there. Just from that side, straight across. Mm-hmm. And she grabbed me and she was like, F, you know. And I'm worn out. But I'm just like sitting there for a second. This is different. All the hairs on my body just like jumped when you did that. <laughs> I just, yeah, I just had to think for a second. I said, well, wait a minute. I said, we know the young ones are out here messing with us. We know they're all over here. I said, I bet you anything, Big Daddy's right there. Right there. Can't see him, but he's right there. And he's telling us that we're back at camp. Can I, can I say stay your ass at camp? <laughs> yeah. Answer? Oh, yeah. You could, whatever you want to say. <laughs> yeah. I said, I think that's exactly what he means. I said, if he keeps doing it, then it's something else. Well, we got to figure out a way out of here. So I'll just sit here. You know, I'm, I'm being cool, calm, and collective. And uh, matter of fact, my dog is just right here. He's so tired. He slept through that. He's just conked out. But, so we sit there for a while, not doing anything, not cooking, nothing. Just sitting there quiet, drinking a cold beer. First one of the day. I want to point that out. And, uh, yeah, just for 30 minutes, there's just nothing going on. So, so we're good. So, so we ended up not making a fire. We ended up eating raw hot dogs because we were so hungry and so tired. But, um, I think maybe 10 minutes after eating the hot dogs, which would have been about 40 minutes after he growled, it all started in again. Ooh, 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 ooh. Going nuts. And I was like, their tone hasn't changed at all. 
I said, they still sound like they're just excited. About it. So, and this guy hasn't made any noise. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to go over there and shine a flashlight because it's, I mean, he was right there, you know, but I can't see it's too thick. And it, over there, it dips down a little bit into a water runoff. So I wouldn't have seen him if he was down on all fours anyways. But Were you um, curious? I, like, did you want to do that? Or were you like, oh, you, oh my gosh. So, so badly, <laughs> <laughs> so badly. But, but I had been making a series of mistakes with my car already. And I thought, I'm not going to make another one. I got to be smart about this. So, you know, and I don't want to piss him off because the, the growl that came from that was just mind blowing. Sound like a chest of an elephant, you know. And uh, she was a little freaked out, but I calmed her down again, saying, I "Remember, I said they wanted to hurt us." And she finished my sentence again. She said, "Yeah, they would already have done it." I said, "So let's yep. just yes, if you want to get in the tent and try to go to sleep." She said, "Yeah, I'm too tired." And I'm like, "Okay, get in." And once again, this is our second night. No, not even a thought of the phone. That's crazy. But they're just going off all over again. And a little bit louder on their movements this time, the second night. And there were more circuf- circumference around us. Now, the only place it wasn't come from was where the big dad was. There was okay. no whoops coming from right there. So, and they were going and going and going just all night. You hear some branches breaking. But it reminded me of like if they put its arm up on a branch and the branch was like dead. And it was like, whoops, it broke. You know, we do that when we go to the woods. And... Uh, <sighs> I went off of memory. I want to say it was about almost four in the morning, if I remember correctly. All the whooping just suddenly came to a stop. Uh, and I want you to keep in mind out here in the Big Ticket National Preserve, um, used to be homesteads out there. And you can still find a lot of remnants of these homesteads, old bicycle, rusted bicycle parts, old old gates, fences, uh, a lot of... Uh, Aluminum, aluminum, uh, what do you call it, siding. And you can just find pieces of it out there. But this I will never, ever forget. I mean, of course, the whole night, two nights, I'm never going to forget. But this this thing was so awesome. And then, and then it wasn't because <laughs> it got irritating. But at 4 o'clock in the morning, it all just stopped. It all went silent. No thing was moving. And like I said, you can hear a pin drop out there. And it's so cold. But, um, you hear this, what I can only describe what she could have only described at the time is what sounded like a baby monkey going, just go crazy. And no, it's not a barn owl, barbed owl, uh, because I, I know them very well. Okay. And also, a barbed owl can't do this. Then it stops. And then you just hear a piece of sheet metal go ding, 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 just weird baby noises, like something really young, just having a blast. It instantly reminded me of, you know, when you were a kid or you had kids, you had kids, and they'll get the pots and pans out from underneath the sink. They might like to bang them together. Yep. I don't know if you've experienced that yet, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, and you're like, oh, so like hey, make it stop, make it stop, you know. You just want some so attention, we just, really. Yeah, we were just like, this is crazy, you know. And it kept going, and we were just listening, and, and Blue had waking up, he just beating that metal's pretty loud, and he's just looking like, he didn't have any idea what was going on, you know. He's just looking around, and he just lays back down. But it's just going, 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 and periodically stopping, making these weird noises, and baby monkey noises again and uh we're like this is really cool but i tell you what after about 30 minutes of that you wanted it to stop so badly you just wanted them to stop because it was so annoying uh, but that went on until a good hour just constant and if i wish i had recorded that because i think that would have been the best part of everything but uh but right when he stopped Maybe five minutes passed, and they started back up. And it sounded like it started getting a little further away, and then finally just died up. No more noise, straight silence. Uh, it's probably 5.30 in the morning. We're both still shocked, dead tired. Our minds are blown. 
you know, and we finally just pass out, wake up, and you know, we go home with that story basically. And yeah. I'll make this next one. I'll make this next one real short. So we get invited no, to a barbecue. Down take the your road. time. We go down there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we're talking to a buddy down the road. And I don't want to use his name either, so I have permission. But a real good friend. We were telling him what was going on, and, and he was like, "I said, I told him, I said I had bought a thermal." And he got excited. He was like, can we go back there? I was like, absolutely. You know, he buys a thermal. So we both go back there. Uh, I think that was what, just the very next week we went back there. And uh, it was me, him, and, and my ex-wife. We got there, um, actually a decent time, probably about 9 p.m. We got a good big fire started because it was cold. Uh, Northerners don't realize that us people on the South, when we say cold, we're talking 30 degrees or something. You know, sure. Out yeah, in, not. Out, yeah, out in a humid forest, thirty degrees is like bone chilling. You know. Yeah, and, and it's all really relative. Even, yeah. Oh yeah, and uh, but we get out there and uh, a couple hours pass and nothing's happening, and I'm like, maybe they don't like this guy, or maybe they just moved off to a different area. I don't know. I said, this sucks that I brought you out here, and I'm telling you how cool it was. And I wanted you to experience it. Is this fairly Nothing's close happened. to the first first two experiences? Like the a time length? Same spot. Uh, I mean, yeah, um, it was all within a yeah, all okay. within about a three and a half week period. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so I take him out there, and like I said, nothing's happening, and a few hours pass, and I know the time exactly because I looked at my phone <laughs> when it happened. 11.15 p.m. precisely, right across the pipeline, the little finger pipeline. There's that little dip I told you about where you got, I got that growl from. Where if you keep going, it'll go up, up the little hill. And from up on that hill, we got the loudest, like, deepest, like, <laughs> Amazing. His jaws was. It was like, what in the hell, you know? And I said, I told you, I'm excited. I'm excited because this is what I brought him for. And I grabbed my thermal. I said, Where's your thermal? He's like, Why? I said, We got to go. This is our chance. We got thermals now. It's like, I ain't going out there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what? <laughs> he wouldn't go. Uh, my ex wife wouldn't go. And I have a golden rule, never go alone. Okay. Stupid. And uh, I broke the rule a couple of times. But, but that sounds that like a good rule because, I mean, yeah, you don't, what are you going to do if you're alone yeah. with a Sasquatch? So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so that happened. That was nothing else the rest of the night. So. But after that, for about six months, um, I would go out there every couple of weeks by myself and just camp. Uh, two, three, four days. Um, I think I've stayed out there for a week sometimes. I, I recorded a lot of good stuff out there when I was out there. I um, had more trees pushed over around me. Never had anything get close and vocalized like it did those first few nights. That was crazy. But um, I've had something walk up close and my dog just freak out, start growling. And, uh, you know, I couldn't see over the hill with my thermal because it slowed down and I'm trying. I just can't see over there. Too thick. Can't see through all the brush. But I uh, stayed out there for quite a while before I finally decided, okay, let's move on to some different areas, which is uh, the next place I went was the San Houston National Forest, primarily because it was closer to me, um, about two hours away from me, whereas that part of the big thicket was about three hours, 15 minutes for me. And... Uh, so driving out there as much as I was, it was time to get something closer. But I still made some trips out there with some other people that I hadn't met doing this and because I wanted them to experience some of the same things I was. And sure enough, they went out there and they experienced the vocals. And uh, I had the same situation with that whoop. That long whoop happened right behind me and a buddy because I was playing some uh, uh, baby uh, uh, kids playing. So it was kids playing in the playgrounds, playing that audio real loud on Bluetooth, see if I could pique curiosity, only because of what I've heard so much about the curiosity of these Sasquatch. 
And uh, we got one that went off right behind us. And I was ready to go in with the thermal. It was not. <laughs> so once again, I'm stuck out. I can't go chasing this thing. I don't want to use the term chasing. I'm just trying to get a better look and get a visual on thermal. That's all I'm trying to do. And, uh, but yeah, I've had a lot of luck out there last year. Um, matter of fact, some of these casts you see behind me, if you can see them. Oh, wow. Sure, okay. Like these. Holy smokes. These yep. were coming out of a, coming out of a creek. Coming out of, are you saying coming out of the creek near that first location? Yeah, same area, big sandy unit. This is one that slid down the mud a little bit. These are not claws. These are toe slides. Jeez, it's look, those things are down. huge. Maybe hold your like yeah. your finger up against some of those, like the, the toes. Yeah, but the, the toes aren't that long. It's, it's because the toe hit the incline of the mud and slid down. Okay. So, but you can see how fat some of the toes are, though. How are those made? Like, you Especially have a, this one. You can oh, see yeah, how big the, that big toe is. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. How yeah, is we that? don't have this as humans. Our, our foot will curve this yep. way because we've worn shoes all our life. It's going to get more of a flat area in here. And as they get older, this whole area is going to get flatter. As they get heavier and older, it'll all get flat. Do you do that type of molding and cask yourself, or how's that done? Yes. Um, simply go to any hobby store and get uh, go to their plaster section, and any kind of plaster they sell will work just fine. Um, a lot of people like to use uh, dental stuff, but... To me, I mean, I've never had a problem with this stuff, and it's very budget-friendly. Yeah, it looks so great. So I'll use it. And as a matter of fact, one good thing I like about this stuff is the reason those casts looked a little brown is because I ran out of material when I was down there. And uh, so I ended up mixing the sand with the material so I could get more out of it, and which works the same way. It's basically making more cement what you're doing, but... Um, these were three individuals that come out of the creek. There weren't any prints coming from the other side of the creek, so they had walked in the creek for a little while and then come out under this bridge, walked back up into the woods, and they all left the print. And that's how I was able to get those castings. Thank you for sharing the stories. I will try to see if we have any more at the end, but I, I want to ask you... Um, just like about Bigfoot Sasquatch lore in general a little bit. Um, I guess the first question I was thinking about is for skeptics, is it the stories? Is it the firsthand experience or what is your go-to to help somebody that is just questioning if Bigfoot is real? Um, how do you not try to like steer them one way or the other? Maybe you do, but what do you, what do you do to help somebody with that question? <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I don't want to sit there and be like, look, Vic, that's real. If you don't believe it, you suck. That's not the way to go about it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. uh, one thing to do is like the audio that I put on my YouTube channel. 99% um, of it is on a spectrogram. So you can see what a, a spectrogram signature is of these Sasquatch. And I also have coyotes and owls and other things. You can see their signatures. Uh, but you won't find anything that matches that anywhere in the animal kingdom, for one. Um, and the good thing about watching that on a spectrogram is you can, somebody can be like, well, that's a human making that noise. Well, a human, our, our, on the spectrogram, our signature, somehow it reverberates. So you'll get the main signature, another one, another one. Another. It's like an echo in the spectrogram. You can't miss it. Uh, whereas everything I've encountered with Sasquatch is normally just one, or unless, it's, unless there's another noise with it that's a slight variance to it, then there will be a shadow of a second. And it's almost like they have either two vocal cords, or 
they have something that makes them different here that, that we can't do. You know, we can't make two different noises at the same time. Okay. And, uh, but the, I think the primary thing I tell them is, um, it's to me, it's the most important thing because you can't go any further without having an open mind. It's like I said in the beginning, you know, if you have a closed off mind, you're dead in the water. Um, and for skeptics out there, I like to remind them that they thought the UFO enthusiasts were nuts, if you remember. Yeah. You know, people that think in UFO, my guess, you know, wearing their tin hats and stuff. Well, who's laughing now? You know, the Navy's already proven that, yeah, there's UFOs and we got footage of them. Here's some footage. So who had the last laugh there? The people with the open mind that were willing to to accept that there may be things out there in this world that they can't explain, but they're there, you know. So Are you, you referencing those? Um, I don't know if, if we're thinking of the right thing, but Joe Rogan had a guest on that kind of revealed that there's these objects that they're just sitting there. And I think it's been more evidence has come out that there's these sort of objects hanging out and they're not really moving. Mm-hmm. Is that what you're talking I about? I've seen or? that Joe Rogan episode. Uh, I don't usually watch a lot of it, not because I don't want to. I just, I, I'm busy. I stay busy constantly. So I am lucky if I get to see things that's separate late at night when I turn TV on. Yeah. But, um, but Navy released footage and the pilots have these things, these unidentified flying objects or whatever they're calling them now. Um, they call them something different now other than UFOs. Uh, I don't know. Aerial phenomena, UIPs or something like that, or okay. UA, UAPs. Yeah, but they have them on film on their in their aircraft that they're flying. They're catching these things, and they there is this particular one that I really liked was over water. And they're seeing these things, and they're they're trying to chase them. They're trying to keep up. These things are just darting off. And the Navy released that. You know, it's it's been a, a, quite a few years, if I remember correctly, but. Uh, it's really good footage, and since then, a little more has come out. And uh, now, you know, at, before, back before that, it was like a big no-no for Navy or even Air Force pilots to report seeing um, unidentified, unidentified flying objects in their airspace uh, because it was kind of like frowned upon, you know, like you're sure. crazy, shut them down, you know, it, it, taking it, your flying status away. Yeah, because it kind of attacks the credibility of the Navy if yeah. somebody doesn't yeah. have any proof or whatever. Yeah. But now they're able to report these things. You know, they have a they have a forum forum uh, to where they can do this without having to worry about being discredited or getting flight status taken away or you know anything like that. So it's good that things have actually stepped uh, in the direction in a positive way. Um, so I say that because the same thing is with Sasquatch. So those that don't believe, don't laugh at the people that have stories or encounters because that's why these people don't want to come out because they don't yeah. want to be laughed at. They don't want to be ridiculed. And if you think, if you look up how many sightings in this area, like Washington, let's use Washington for an example, and say there's a confirmed 680 sightings within a 10-year period. And the skeptic is like, well, those people are crcrazy, and that's not very many. Well, first you got to keep into account that's not very many for a reason. Uh, the number is probably three times, if not more, more than that 680. It's because those people are scared to come forward because of the people like you that are closed-minded and want to make fun of those people. So most cases, most encounters go unreported, act. Um, yeah, and I, I can tell you that a per- personal experience from speaking with people out in the woods, because when I go out there, we've been out there for a month in the woods camping, you know, and we've talked to hunters, uh, fishing, fishermen on creeks and rivers up in these forests. Um, and you'd be surprised at people that don't tell you anything until like the next day or the next time they see you, they'll be like, you know what, I think I can talk to you about this. And they'll tell you something. I don't want to be ridiculed, um, you know. Yeah. So people would be really surprised about how many people do not report their encounter. Um, so if we can get it to where people are getting more comfortable and more comfortable um, 
with things that close-minded people don't understand. If those close-minded people just kind of understand that there's things in the world that may be foreign to their mind, but if you don't open it and let something in and do your own research, you're not going to learn and you're not going to let these other people, you know, but some of these people have terrifying encounters. Um, some yep. of them are terrifying because they're terrifying, actually terrifying, or because they were what's not terrifying to me or you might be terrifying to them. And they have to carry this burden, but they can't tell anybody because people want to ridicule. So I, you know, for what I would say, keep your mind open. It's so important. And don't ridicule people without doing your own research. You know, if you think something's crazy, and I say this it's like dead seriousness, I can't tell you how many times I've had people comment on something of even mine. They're like, oh, that's fake. Uh, that's that's set up, blah, blah, blah. And I tell them, I, same thing I tell everybody. I said, skeptics, to us going out, skeptics is a healthy thing, you know, because we actually have to show proof and not opinion to skeptics for so you to believe. So I think I invite skeptics out. And not one in probably the last six years, not one skeptic has took me up on the invitation. Not one. I don't know what that's about. But. So don't downgrade somebody or something like that. If you yourself don't have the balls to go out there and experience something for yourself, that's big. Thank you. Yes, I I completely love where you're going from or where you're coming from with it. You need to have an open mind. Yes. Um, I try to have an open mind and um, I've heard, um, you know, I know people that really believe in shape shifting and um, pe the afterlife and uh, angels and, all, you know, all of these different things across the spectrum. And I don't, I wouldn't say that I'm a skeptic. Um, I'm just curious. And so it's hard for mm -hmm. me to really figure out. Sometimes I don't even know where I'm at yet, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Same yeah. thing I used to me. Because, <laughs> like, I have definitely seen compelling evidence. And so I'll, I'll say that. But your the logic part of your brain is like, well, you know. So right. you just have to continue to dig into it. Okay, so yeah. one thing you mentioned at the beginning, which kind of is something I wanted to get into, is you were talking about you had originally thought maybe Bigfoot or Sasquatch is in PNW or um, maybe more mountainous areas. And then you were like surprised to discover that Bigfoot is in Texas. And so this has always been something I've kind of thought is like, I think when I was really young, I thought there was one Bigfoot. And it was like, we're trying to find the Bigfoot and there right. wasn't mul multiple, you know? And then I kind of, my wife and I, um, I think discussing with her family and friends came to this conclusion that obviously there's not one, it's sort of like, there's a lot. And so now I'm wondering, maybe based on research you've done or looking into this, is Bigfoot a species? Is Bigfoot, in, is there a difference between Bigfoot and Sasquatch? Is the Bigfoot in Texas similar to like what you might find in Washington. And I mean, I don't want to make you answer all these things, but I was also thinking about like, is there Bigfoot lore in other con other countries, you know, across the oceans and do they have Bigfoot in Europe, et cetera, that kind of stuff. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's a lot of questions in one. So you may have to help me a lot. Yeah. Away so I don't forget some of your questions, but sorry. About and, that. Um, a lot. No, that's fine. And a lot of this uh, would be, you know, opinion-based, of course. Um, the first thing I want to start with, I guess, would be, um, are they the same in one area as they are to another area, like, for example, Texas to Washington? Um, and I, I think it kind of goes with uh, your environment. Um, I think your environment plays a big role in what the differences are going to be on a Sasquatch. Uh, which brings me to another one of your questions, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, same thing. What uh, To me, Bigfoot is a, uh, not, I can't think of the word I'm wanting to use, um, a novelty name. 
um, where it's like Bigfoot toys, Bigfoot candy, Bigfoot apparel, you know. Uh, I, don't, I try not to use the word Bigfoot when I'm doing anything. Uh, if there's a documentary, if there's something I'm making for the channel, I try to always say Sasquatch. Sometimes I say Bigfoot, but I try to always say Sasquatch. Uh, just because it sounds more of a proper or scientific name. Uh, yeah. Even though it's not really a scientific name, but to me, it's just more of a, it gives them more of a name. I don't want to call them a novelty name, Bigfoot, you know. Oh, I like you uh, saying that because that makes complete yeah. sense, so. Yeah, yeah. Now, I have no problem with people using the word Bigfoot, of course. None whatsoever. Um, people use it in their group names and stuff like that. That's fine because we know what you're talking about. But but when I'm having a discussion with somebody, I prefer to use uh, Sasquatch, uh, especially in something that's more serious, just for that reason. Um, but being the same from one region to another, as far as the United States goes, I, I think it, it's going to completely depend on your environment. Um, your, your climate, your environment is going to be way different than my climate and environment. You know, um, you'll hear a lot of things if, for listeners that have heard or listened to other podcasts um, about Sasquatch encounters. They may have heard stories about how Sasquatch in Texas is just uh, so aggressive. You know, so violent. And, uh, I want to go out there and say, I've really been hitting up Texas really good for maybe only about six years. And I have not experienced anything aggressive whatsoever yet. So maybe that has to do with hunters. Because somebody going out in the woods and, and coming face to face with something that they didn't even believe to begin with, and then pointing your gun at it. That, that number one rule is if you come across one, don't point your gun or rifle at it. I, I know you might be scared to death. But if he's just giving you a look and even a menacing look, he's not doing anything wrong to you yet. You're in his environment, you're, you're on his property, you know. Uh, just as soon as you can get your thoughts back about you and your legs start working again, just go away. Just calmly go away. Don't raise your gun at it. Unless it's an absolute, like this thing is going to come and tear me apart. He's coming. Do what you got to do. I understand it. But, but I, yeah, I think uh, weather and climate, you know, environment have a lot to do with uh, how one may be different from another area. Like we went up and filmed with Jason Kinsey searching for Sasquatch 7 in the Rockies. And I was totally out of my element, you know. Uh, send, send me to the mountains and tell me to find Sasquatch evidence. I wouldn't even know where to start, you know, because I'm not familiar with that terrain at all. Uh, tell me to go find evidence in Texas. I'm sure I'll be back in an hour, you know. And uh, because it's, to me, it's so easy to find evidence here uh, in these national forests here because they're really relatively small compared to other areas like Washington, Arkansas, you know, their national forest areas are huge. And uh, also with that, I don't want to give off the idea that Sasquatch only inhabit national forest and preserves and wildlife management areas. That's not the case. Um, it's like Dallas, Texas, it's got Trinity River that flows through it and other creeks and subsidiaries that flow through and behind houses and through neighborhoods, and they're heavily wooded in them in the creek area. And there's lots of encounters. Uh, these things coming up to back windows and other things, and there's been evidence found that they'll travel through these areas. So, yeah, don't believe that they're just a national, they're just a forest giant, you know. These things anywhere where there's a, even a little bit of wood line to get from one location to another without being spotted, they'll use it. Uh, river systems they're going to use, and if it goes through your neighborhood, so be it. You know, um, as long as they think they can stay hidden, you're, nobody's off limits as to location as to where you might find evidence or might actually see one. As long as you have some kind of wood line going by where you're at, I think you've got a good chance if you're paying attention. But uh, most you... people aren't paying attention for that. Do you buy into? I've heard people say that. There might be some supernatural lore with Bigfoot. So in my mind, is it, it, I'm trying to say, I'm trying to categorize Bigfoot. Like, is it supernatural in a sense that 
they go into these areas that are a little bit more populated, but they're seemingly never seen? Or is it just that they are very smart and they have this like sixth sense and don't, or is it strictly animal? It's not supernatural. Right. So uh, what I find is the, the main categories of what Sasquatch is, how it does what it does is uh, people that believe that there is a supernatural ability about them. Or um, if you want to say, going from uh, one realm to another. Um, what do you call that? Dimension, like going through dimensions and stuff. And then you've got um, the ones that believe... They like astral plane? They come from down from UFOs. Sure, yeah, astral plane, dimensions, uh, portals, stuff like that. And then you got the ones that believe they are uh, somehow coming with aliens from space. Um, and then you've got... People, I'm in this. I'm in this sub corner where I believe they're flesh and blood. They're a relic hominid, hominid. So they've been around for thousands of years, and they just managed to survive. Um, but with that being said, I, I you know, especially the people that believe in dimensions and in, in that category, I can't say anything bad to you because there's been some weird things out there in the woods, you know. Um, like I've been walking through the woods with a buddy late at night, and uh, matter of fact, this was the big sandy unit where I had my encounters, and it was just him and I at five two o'clock in the morning, super dark, and uh, we just have a big, huge flash of light all around us, just poof, and go away, and just in an instant. It's something I'll never be able to explain. Um, is it Sasquatch related? I don't know. Um, do they go through dimensions? I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I just don't know. Um, I only know what I've been able to witness. So, and you know, if I witness something that's crazy like that, then I'll be like, wow, you know, that, that is crazy. But a lot of people believe they're blending into where you can't see them very well is for one. Uh, that's why they call them forest ninjas. Um, oh yeah. I haven't, that's their, I think I've yeah. heard that, but I forgot. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's their environment, you know, they know how to blend there very well. And also, you know, with their hair and uh, with most uh, animal hair, there's a, I forget what the strand is that's inside the hair. And I don't want to say it because I may be wrong on the term, but uh, hairs found from Sasquatch don't have that. So it's almost like a translucent hair. Uh, it's like, so if it's translucent, how does that play into camouflaging? Does that help, you know, certain lighting? I don't know. Um, I have also encountered red glowing eyes and one I saw. And other people have not encountered that. Other people have encountered different color, like blue and green. So to me, it's all just something that I, as far as that goes, that I just can't even answer, except for the fact that for me, in my opinion, it's a relic common uh, flesh and blood creature. Um, it may have some really good experience because it lives in the forest, it's raised in the forest, it knows how to use its surroundings to, to a master level. And uh, any abilities, uh, the hair it has, I think I said fur, and I take that back because I don't want to say fur, it's not a dog. Um, these have hair. So, and, I mean, any, anything, any abilities they have that are natural, I can understand completely being they're the master of their environment. Um, some things I can't explain is I've been one of the people that I have found a couple of footprints and then all of a sudden there's no more prints. Where did it go? You know, yeah. where's the next <laughs> print? You know, I've been just as stumped as other people out there. And, uh, you know, I, I try to theorize and you know, maybe it was running and it just jumped, and it can jump a lot further than I think. And so the next prints in the vegetation, you're not going to see it anyways. But yeah, maybe it just goes know, right you know? straight no into the trees. Right. Um, and um, other countries, yes. Uh, yeah, Europe, uh, Afghanistan, they're called the rock apes. 
and you can Google stories on the rock apes of Afghanistan, and you'll you'll get to hear some pretty amazing encounters and understand why they call the rock apes. Um, also, something to point out is with Indians that uh, the Indians that did totem poles. Uh, for people who wonder if Sasquatch is a real animal or really common it or whatever, if it's real, period. Indians, when they made totem poles, always used animals as, animals as the spirits. <clears throat> they always used real animals. They never used something fake. And Sasquatch is on some of those totems. So that's take that that's as, pretty... as what you will, you know. I mean, I don't know anything about, like... What type of animals? Like I'm taking your word for it because I haven't researched that, but it makes sure. sense to me that you know indigenous tribes would use real animals. That that's kind of like sounding right. So if they are using Sasquatch on those, that that's pretty good evidence. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, of course, there's a lot of stories that go back with the Indians about uh, at one time they were supposedly friendly with these with these Sasquatch. Um, as far as even trading with them and stuff, but I haven't looked as much into that as I probably should have. So I really can't comment further on that, but um, it's always possible that a relic hominid would see how we came in and wiped out so many indigenous peoples from the United States area, you know? And if I was a relic hominid out there, I think I'd want to hide also. Yeah. A lot of possibilities. Um, okay, I so you mean you mentioned Jason Kenzie, and from some yes. of the stuff you shared with me, it looks like you did some. What is it? Maybe a documentary, or you've done some uh, media with him. Can you talk about how you got connected with him yeah, and what uh, you guys have done? He, he is a, a filmmaker, a producer. Did he does his own documentaries, searching Sasquatch. He's from uh, Canada. His name is Jason Kenzie, and. Uh, for people that watch his documentaries, uh, one thing you realize about Jason is uh, humor. Humor is a big thing to him. Um, he's always trying to be very humorous. And so sometimes when people watch the documentaries, they may not take him as serious because he jokes a lot. Um, but I do want to remind the people that these documentaries where certain teams are on there. You know, everything that you're hearing and seeing is absolute seriousness from us. And, yeah, we love Jason Kinsey because he's funny. I mean, there's no boring moments with the guy. And so he'll keep you laughing. But I just don't want people to get the idea that, well, he jokes so much on his documentaries. They're probably all just fake. You know, they're not. Everything's 100 percent real in them. And um, uh, one of the team members, uh, Todd Parsons had gotten in contact with him. I don't remember how, um, but Jason wanted to film an episode in Texas, and we were going to go to a city called, a uh, little city, town, Link of an Eye town called Burkeville, Texas. And this is uh, pretty much almost right on the Sabine River that borders Texas and Louisiana, and that's a big highway for them, a lot of active, active Sasquatch encounters and activity in that area, the whole area. East Texas and Louisiana going up and down. And uh, so he wanted to come down and shoot the documentary. And we, yeah, we'll take you to this place. Uh, we know the property owner. He's going to come out there also. Um, because the property owner there had had a pretty scary encounter. And uh, so we wanted to go there. And there was a creek that flows right by the property also going to the river. So the location was just perfect. I mean, couldn't ask for a better spot. Uh, but when you ask somebody to come down or have somebody come down who's going to film a documentary and you're going to take him out someplace so he can film it for you, there's no guarantee there's going to be any activity whatsoever, you know. And uh, so when I was going out there to Burkeville, this was going to be my first time there too. And I just don't know what's going to happen. All I can do is hope. I hope there's some activity for him, you know. They go back to the boring documentary. Uh, but when he came out there, it just happened to be one of the most active nights that I've personally experienced and some of the other team members have personally experienced. I mean, the audio we got, uh, we got a thermal picture of one, um, that Robert Mikulik, one of the TAPS team members, he caught Hawkins thermal, um, beautiful thermal picture of a Sasquatch. Um, 
audio was just incredible. So, and I, I think his documentaries are on, they're free on Tubi, they're on Prime Video, um, they're on other places too. You just have to do the search for searching for Sasquatch, Jason Kenzie, and I'll pull them up. Um, so after we did that one with him, he wanted to do shoot another one in the Rockies. Uh, so we went up there, uh, TAPS team, myself, uh, Todd Parsons, uh, and Todd's son, a couple other people, um, and Robert Kreider from Kreider Expeditions. Um, he's got his own YouTube thing. Uh, if anybody hasn't seen his stuff, go to Kreider Expeditions or KX on YouTube. Amazing stuff. Like this guy is smart. He does treasure hunting also. And uh, yeah, very, very awesome to watch this stuff. And so we met up there and I, you know, I was, like I said, I was out of my element. I have never searched the Rockies. Where am I supposed to look for a Sasquatch? You know, I don't know where to go. And I'm also used to searching flat ground. So you want me to hike up that? What? <laughs> <laughs> it took me a few days to adapt. Yeah, I bet. In the elevation yeah. and the climate change. Oh my gosh, yes. And, uh, we had one come through, I guess it was the second or third night, and it left a print in the camp that uh, Robert Kreider was able to take make a cast out of. And uh, But yeah, those documentaries, you just have to search them on Google. I know for sure they're on Tubi and uh, Amazon Prime. What was your role oh, yeah. with that? Like, what were you a guide or... Uh, what was we were your... just going to take him out there and uh, kind of take him to a hot spot and just start shooting any footage that we could get, evidence, anything, just showing them anything we could find, um, anything we could hear at night, catching it for them, thermals, just, yeah, anything we could get for them. It was like going out for Expedition Bigfoot and somebody was filming it and uh narrating it he was doing most of the narrating i mean we did a lot of talking also there's some encounters in there as well um, but yeah it was a lot of fun because jason he's, he's a great guy he's funny like i said he'll keep you laughing but just don't want people to take that laughter uh the wrong way because he's not being serious that's just his personality what was the overall uh, experience like were you pretty happy with it uh yeah yeah it was really good um Somebody told me about some of the comments on Amazon Prime on it about how stuff, oh, that's fake, or, those vocals are fake, blah, 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 which, you know, I don't care. Can't make everybody happy. But I do want to tell you that they probably made those because of his jokingly personality. But oh, well, everything on there is 100% real. So. Just yeah. so you know, I, I have never – I looked at a lot of your stuff before when I was researching it, but I actually never looked at the comment section. So I didn't – I had no idea yeah. that – any about any of that oh uh, yeah on my stuff on the youtube channel i think uh, pretty much all positive comments um had a couple of naysayers that i've invited out but never heard back from them so chopper <laughs> you know so. um how do you um capture audio and thermal evidence so, like you just using a recording device or do you kind of try to find a hot spot and then like what is the how does that technology work? I'll show you something here. Um, this is just one of my setup. I don't have the recorder in here, but uh, just have this box, uh, external mic. Um, it's rechargeable. Um, just your simple voice recorder will go in this box, and I'll have an external battery pack put in here. So I can have everything continuously recording on battery until the external dies or the recorder fills up on audio. And I'll take this out to an area that I know is active or if it's an area that I have not been to yet and I want to see if it's active. And I will put it on the up as high up in a tree as I can possibly get it. Um, normally facing an area that has a clearing or something. So the sound isn't too distorted that it, that it can capture, but getting it as high as possible and uh, leave it out there for, I usually leave these things out for five to seven days um, and come back, download it all. And a uh, hot tip for people who want to do this, set your recording to record uh, like two hours before dusk and then maybe end an hour after dawn. 
uh, so you're not having to go through all this daytime audio because it's nerve wracking and the time is just ridiculous that it goes to, to takes to go through all this. It's that's one of the things that burnt me out on the audio going through all that. But, is it much quieter at night? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, don't put it right near a pond or right near a creek, and you're going to get noise pollution of a thousand frogs. You just don't want that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's really clear. Uh, um, the noise, uh, putting your uh, noise, your, your buffer over your microphone will definitely help with the wind. Um, it'll help if it rains. It makes uh, the audio that comes through it a lot more clear. Okay. Um, all right. So I guess at this point, I wanted to switch back to uh, stories. I know we'd, you've already shared mm-hmm. way more stories than uh, I had expected. No. So, and when you shared your, I didn't really say this, but when you were talking about your first two encounters, I can understand how, you know, you were curious about it. You go out, you have these two things happen and then it's like, well, now I'm all in. Yeah. All right. (laughs) Um, I wanted to ask if, do you have any just stories at the top of your mind that are some of the best? Um, And also I remember you said something about there's a correlation between Sasquatch and coyotes. So if you have any Mm -hmm. story around that too. Okay. Um, well, uh, start with the uh, Sasquatch and coyotes. You know, a lot of people theorize the same thing or have the same belief in it. Um, but a lot of things that we experience out in the forest when we're out there doing our thing is when we hear vocals, a lot of times we'll hear a Sasquatch vocal and maybe one, two, or three of them. And then it'll be quiet for a little bit. And then the coyotes will start in. And uh, you'll still have some Sasquatch vocals in those coyotes. And then the coyotes will die out. And then maybe a Sasquatch vocal later. But hearing this, you can see it on Spectrogram when you look at the audio that you've recorded, but mainly from being out there and hearing it in person. Um, We've heard several times where coyotes will make its kill. And then the Sasquatch will make a loud roar or something. And uh, the coyotes will go silent. And uh, then sometimes we'll hear coyotes going off. And then you'll hear a Sasquatch vocal, loud, long. And then those uh, coyotes will either be closer to where that vocal came from or that Sasquatch will be closer to where those coyotes were. So assuming maybe a locator, um, I kind of compare it to um, fast food. For us, because maybe a Sasquatch is like, let's use the coyotes for a quick meal. <laughs> well, I'll let them like, hunt it. They're going to know we had Yeah. It, you know? Okay. Yeah. And uh, there was one night in particular, and this was, uh, I don't remember if this was 2023 winter or, or winter 2022, but me and two other were on a bridge in the Sam Houston National Forest. Um, we well, were camping in an overflow hunter's camp over there, and uh, I think it was, I think it was February, end of hunting season, and it was probably about 11 o'clock at night, uh, cold night. We decided let's just go act like we're fishing off the bridge and act just normal, because most people in this area on this bridge in the San Houston National Forest called Stubblefield Bridge. Uh, people that are from the area who know about it are familiar with it. And on this particular bridge, a lot of people won't stay past dark to fish because of the activity at this place. And uh, But we're out there, and that's what they're, we're there for, the activities. And, and we decided to go out there on that bridge and just act like we're fishing. I've always got a uh, body cam on me, so I don't miss anything that happens. And, Probably about an hour after being out there, you hear these coyotes go off. Um, not, it couldn't have been any further than 100 yards away from us. And they're loud. They're just going off. They, you know, they've made their kill. And then all of a sudden, you hear this Sasquatch roar. Just, I mean, it was intense, intense. 
and then it ended and then another one oh, not quite as intense but still intense and we're all just like wow you know and uh, you hear the, the coyotes you know they're gone they're gone but and uh, luckily i caught that on the body cam so that's on my channel not sure what title it's under that i don't know but it's on the channel somewhere and uh, that was very intense and it was a great example of that Other than that, just um, by mainly just by hearing, hearing the Sasquatch with the coyotes, catching them, the, a, a lot of recordings where the coyotes are going off and the Sasquatch are in there with them. You can see their signature. You can hear them. Um, and they sound like they're just right there together. So why is that? I mean, maybe compare it to humans and our dog companions. You know? Could be something along the same lines. Or, like I said, maybe they use it to help them hunt, you know. Why not? Smart. It's smart. That makes complete sense. I was thinking that before we even got started, I was like, yeah, I mean, I like to go out. You know, I've gone out with uh, my grandpa and a long time ago, but he had a dog. And it just it's way easier when you have a dog. Um, but right. the coyote seems like a perfect companion for a Sasquatch. So mm -hmm. sure. I mean, well, you don't work, uh, work harder, not, I mean, work smarter, not harder, you know, maybe it That's goes right. for Sasquatch too. So. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, <laughs> what would you say is one of the most convincing pieces of evidence or a story that you've encountered? And I think you said you saw red eyes one time. So did you actually see one with your own eyes in person? Okay. Yeah. That one I've seen, uh, in person, I, now during the daytime, I saw an arm of one, um, that it was fast. But at the night, this was the big, big Sandy where the first, um, encounters happened. And we were driving down a dirt road out there and we were just looking, they were using a thermal on the right side of this dirt road. Um, I couldn't look at the thermal cause I was driving. So. Uh, but we're about to come around this curve, and I just happened to notice because the red eyes stuck out like a sore thumb as, as dark as it was out there. And I look over, and I can see these red eyes, and I can see something darker than the dark, the silhouette, and it's, just, it's thick. And it, it was fast. It's just, I mean, right when I see it, it goes from two eyes to one eye because it's turning, and it darts into the woods, and I pull up into I didn't see anything with my headlights because my headlights hadn't come around that curve yet. Um, but I pulled over immediately and we listened. They, they tried using the thermals, but it was just too dense. You couldn't see through that stuff, so, but we could hear something move them trying to quietly move on further and further. So that was my first visual encounter at nighttime and the glowing red eyes. I have no idea. Maybe they absorb energy during the day from the sunlight. I have no idea. You know, couldn't tell you. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Daytime, I was with somebody. We were with the whole group. We were having a group outing, and one one individual was like looking in the woods. He's like, "You see this?" And he's, he's crouched down, so I crouched down and I'm looking. I see something, and it just looks like I don't see a hand. I just see this this fur uh, hair. Excuse me, hair in between some branches, and I'm like, "Yeah, it's that," you know. And he's like, so you see it? And I was like, I see it. You see it? And he's like, I see it. Confirming with each other. And like, is that an arm? It's so thick back there. And he was like, this is incredible. And all of a sudden, he goes, it just moved. I didn't see anything move. So I looked at him real fast. What? I didn't see it move. And I looked back, and it's gone. And then he goes, oh, it just got up and left. We were looking at two different things. We thought we were looking at the same thing. I said, I was looking at what looked like maybe an arm. He was like, oh, no, no. What I saw was like a shoulder, hairy shoulder. And I was like, oh. So I asked him, well, can you show me where you saw yours? And we went back there, which was a pain in the butt because it was so thick. And he was like, right here. We couldn't see any evidence because the ground is just, the substrate just so hard and thick with pine and leaves. And it was a different spot than where I was looking. So I guess we saw two different ones. And it was probably about couple hours before it got dark which is a common area for encounters in that area but yeah that was pretty cool but i wish i had seen more than an arm you know but 
beggars can't be choosers. Now, um, on thermals, we've seen it's, it's pretty good stuff on thermals. And I, I wish I could bring up a picture for you, but I have no idea where it's at on my phone. I could show you. Um, I don't know if you want to pause for a second and I'll look for it. No, no, I I wish I had the technology to like allow you to share that. Um, but do you have that on your YouTube oh, channel? It doesn't show. Well, no. If you if you hold up your phone, I would be able to see it. But um, if you want to, yeah. you're welcome to look. If you want, I just don't remember. Um, it's funny because I've sent this to so many people, and I can never remember where I got it. If you want to send me anything after the episode, I'd be glad yeah. to leave it in I'll the description. It after. Yeah. If you do, is this okay? Um, you can edit edit this I, out. No, you, I don't. It's up. Yeah. It's it's completely okay with me. Um, so don't worry about that. I know it messes with audio sometimes. The sh oh no 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 um, no! Don't worry about it. Um, I've had uh, another guy do a cigar on here. Oh, um, okay. Um. All right. So I noticed you said that you have some amazing pictures and videos but they're not shared with the public. Um, are you able to hint at oh. what that is or why it hasn't been made available? Yeah, the reason I say this is sometimes we get invited out to uh, private property and somebody that has activity and just wants us to come, he wants to share the encounters with us or activity with us, have us come experience on the property. And I, I've been to a few and Gosh, I'd, I'd say probably nine or nine or ten photos I have seen from different people really close within the group or property owners that were like real iffy about showing it to begin with uh, because they just don't share it. And it comes back to, again, being ridiculed and oh, people are just going to say it's fake or something. So why bother? I just keep this to myself and they'll show me and I've seen pictures of Sasquatch that just screw up on game cams. They get caught in the corner or something. I mean, clear pictures. And uh, that's rare because apparently the Sasquatch's eyes can see the IR light and the game cameras at night. So they'll go in during the day. So they will avoid them at all costs. But um, I've seen footage of, I don't know what you call it, a, a baiting area or a feeding area where people will put feed out for deer and stuff. Uh, to, I guess to pull them into the leases and stuff, and they'll shoot their game cams at that. And I've seen very large Sasquatch stand up way back behind these bushes and just keep going up. Uh, I mean, he had to have been eight foot tall at least. And you can see his eyes, his, his hair, everything. And it was just it was awesome. I tried to get it. He wouldn't let me. Every time somebody showed me something, I tried to ask if I can take a picture of the picture or of the video, and they're like, no, absolutely not. Don't want this out there. But people wonder if there's clear video evidence or picture evidence. Yeah, there is, but you can't call it evidence because I haven't come across anybody that actually wanted to share it with anybody. So, And I wish they would because it's incredible stuff. It's just not happening. Wow, that I mean, that's such yeah. a bummer because <laughs> like no, I know. that had to have been incredible for you to see it though. Like if somebody's like letting you see it I've been in amazed. your hand. I've been, I've seen an orb with people feel a good buddy of mine. It was out with some of his friends and feeling this orb behind what behind a tree and they walked up to it and this thing shoots up the tree. It's, it was, it was cool. <laughs> it was cool. <laughs> But, but you got to be in their circle to see it. So it's just not going to get shared out there. Okay. Um, well, for anybody listening that wants to get involved with Sasquatch or Bigfoot, um, what's the best way for someone to get started? Uh, well, first, I would listen to as many uh, podcasts and encounters as you can about Sasquatch because uh, you can learn a lot from them. Some of them I've heard sound way far-fetched, uh, but 
still of the whole lot of them. I learned a lot from them before I ever started going out. Uh, that's where I learned a lot. And then I could, because once you start hearing all that and picking it up on it, then you, when you're out there, you have something to relate your experience to. It's like, oh, I've heard about this or that, you know, and it, and it helps uh, kind of solidify what's going on with you out there. And uh, basically the next step is just, if you're wanting to catch your experience, that you're going to need a recorder or take your phone. I like a body cam because you don't have to carry anything and it's recording the whole time. So you won't miss anything. But, um, basically just go, just get out there and try to get a buddy to go with you and hit up a group on Facebook and ask them about hot locations. A lot of people will share hot locations with you. Ask them people in the group if somebody wants to go out. A lot of times people in the group will be all for it and want to go out with you and show you stuff. And you'll learn a lot from them. Um, if you're in the Texas area, hit us up on TAPS Facebook or uh, on the YouTube channel. You can eat through my emails there also. So you can email me straight to me, which is shane.lee41 at yahoo.com is my straight email. Um, Anybody who wants to go out, we don't mind you coming out and experiencing things as well. So it just becomes one big family out there. We have a blast, regardless if we get activity or not. As an experienced content creator, what challenges have you faced when you're producing your own content? Honestly, time management. Okay. Finding the time. <laughs> that's that's the biggest thing for me. I stay busy and finding the time to sit down and go through. It takes, I mean, you know, it takes a lot of time to go through editing or going through audio. And, uh, you know, that's just the first step. Then you got to put it into a video and it's a lot of work. So time management, definitely. Did you have you to teach have yourself time. all those things like the editing? I mean, cause the oh. fun part is getting out there and doing it, but the editing is not something I knew how to do. So. Absolutely. And I use a VS, a VSDC uh, free editing software. And uh, they do have a premium one you can pay for also. And it's, it's not expensive. But, um, so I just chose that one, opened it when I first started and started the YouTube videos of how to and how to do this. And it's learned from scratch just by doing that. You know, learn from other people. It's the best thing to do. So. And it took a while. Um, going over audio, I downloaded Audacity. It's free. And uh, you can download your audio files to it and do the same thing. Use YouTube as your friend to search for instructions on how to use these things. And it makes life a lot easier. It did take a lot of time, though. And there's still a lot I don't know. Well, same. Um, can you recommend any? Sasquatch documentaries or movies or a book, like anything that people can go to that's going to be just quality information? Um, there's a YouTube channel called uh, Small Town Monsters. Uh, I like the quality they put out. Uh, they got a lot of good stuff. Um, my stuff, of course, I'm biased. That's right. So you have to my my YouTube channel for that. And um, uh, movies, though. Wow. Uh, one movie I really enjoyed was a movie called Exist. Uh, that was really good. Uh, but as far as just really good, comparable to what I know uh, would be more actual Bigfoot activity, there is an old movie out there. And I can't for the life of me remember what that movie is. But there's um, The Legend of Boggy Creek would be a good one. That's based on a true story. And, um, man, I wish I could remember that other one because I, I would tell everybody. But I've searched it on Google and everything. I cannot find that movie again. And it's an older one. It's probably filmed in the 70s. But it's like it's it's so perfect as to the activity you would experience. It's not far fetched like some of these other movies. You know, I've seen movies where people where the movies have Sasquatch wearing you know 
tridents and stuff. I'm like, what are you doing? This is why you give bad Sasquatch a bad name. <laughs> you know, make it more ne- necklaces and hoods. And I'm like, come on. But, so yeah, exist, Legend of Bayou Creek, and uh, other than that, just Google, you know, Bigfoot movies, and you'll come across ones that are actually pretty good and ones that are just ridiculous. Okay. Uh, well, Shane, I think I'm kind of coming to the end of my question. So I do want to turn it over to you and just see, was there anything you wanted to cover that we haven't, or was there any story that you wanted to make sure you got in? Um, and I'm totally okay on time. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, stories. Uh, there's a lot of stories, but, um, I think I've got a couple of, uh, well, a funny one that comes to mind is we were camping at a overflow hunters camp at a location and hunting season had just gotten over and there were some people coming out camping. There was two of these different people, particularly that just looked like they hadn't ever camped, um, had a lot of trouble sitting their tent up and everything. You know, to, to us, they were complete newbies to the camping environment here. But, and plus their gear was brand new. But, uh, they were camping and we, we were talking to ourselves, uh, you know, whoever was out with me at the time, other team members about how we've seen campers come out and all of a sudden at night there's these crazy vocals that go on in this location because it happens a lot. And when it happens, people will get scared, come over and say, did you hear that? Or they'll just leave and stuff like that. And uh, I remember this particular night because it was the first time that we had two separate campers do it. But it was probably about, it was actually it wasn't very late. I think it was like 930 at night. And uh, this vocal just went off. It was crazy. It was awesome, crazy. And I've never seen two campers simultaneously almost grab their crap, throw it in the car, left their tents and just gone gone never came back uh, both this time that we were out there we were out there for three weeks but they had never came back and uh, so we've seen that happen uh, were they spooked often. like they saw something and they're like let's get out of here it was the vocal the vocal was so oh. loud that it scared the hell out of them and they took off and uh, there was another night that we were out there and uh, it was probably about three o'clock in the morning, and I was awoken to what sounded like a, I like I can only describe it as like a Sasquatch, a female Sasquatch, like crying, like upset that she's walking, and she's walking up the river. But she just, it, I can't even explain it. It was loud. It was creepy, but, and it sounded like she was very upset. And uh, it woke me up, and it woke up the other guys that were with me. And then there was a guy that was camped in the camp spot next to us. He was going uh, hog hunting that night. And when I woke up, you know, he was all packed up and I wanted to talk to him because I had met him before. And I said, did you hear that last night? I said, yep, I did. I was going to go hog hunting. I didn't go hog hunting. I said, I'm just <laughs> going to leave. I'm gone. He's leaving. So he left. And that's happened a lot. And we've actually seen hunters when we'd go out there and stay at these hunters camps during hunting season, you know, they do their thing during the day. We would do our thing at night. And uh, we had some that would tell us their encounters and stories after they'd get to know us for a while. Uh, But we've seen uh, quite a few hunters come out there that were just non-believers, you know, just totally never been hunting for years, never seen anything. And it just so happened, they go out in the morning and they get this loud roar or something like that. And they come back and they tell us and they leave. They leave the hunter's camp. They're done. They said, I'm never hunting again. And which was sad to hear. I mean, if you're a hunter, don't get scared about something that's unfamiliar to you. You know, sure, it's going to freak you out. I understand. But get back out there. You know, it's like what they say, you fall off the bike, get back on it. You know, but, yeah, but I, I've seen a lot of people scared out of the woods. Lots of hunters that say they're never going to hunt again. Um, several of them that have said, I've had many experiences out there that have been weird. Said, I'm still going to hunt. But, you know, and I've had some to, to flat out say, I've hunted all my life, never seen anything weird. Um, and we've had the ones that have said, I've never seen anything weird. And so until I started looking into the Bigfoot subject, 
And now that I know what to look for and I'm paying attention to these things, he said, now things start to make sense about stuff that did happen that I didn't think about before in the past. And uh, so some of them were very open like that. And, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, the stories that stories would go on for hours if we started into all the stories. Um, because there's families that have had encounters. We've gone to their property, investigate. And, I mean, I wouldn't know where to start and where to stop. But, yeah. Well, it would take this- forever. <laughs> uh maybe we'll do uh uh a part two in the future at some point um oh sure shane i just seriously i want to say thank you so much for coming on i hope it was enjoyable for you um it has been a really treat a really big treat for me and i hope a lot of people listening will enjoy it too um so oh, yeah, yeah i just want to say I, I enjoyed it too yeah and i'm sorry it takes so long to get to do this because we've been trying to Not do it all. for but like two weeks. <laughs> no, I'm so yeah, glad I'm we got to. I got home. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to be home, and I'm glad I got to help you with that, too. So. Yes. Yeah, that's no thank, problem at all. Absolutely. <clears throat> thank you. And uh, I will go ahead and call it, and then um, I'll hit stop recording.